Hello, thank you so much for joining me today to talk about the future of work and quite a few other issues that we have currently, such as productivity and resilience and all these yeah. good stuff. And I can't wait to dive into it. Perfect. You're most welcome. So dive in. Let's dive in. So I spotted your article at um, the Harvard Business Review that um, basically the point of view is you did a survey and it, um, and you can tell me more about it. But bottom line is productivity has gone up and we're enjoying more our time and focusing on what matters. So why don't you tell me a little bit about that survey? Sure. So I did a survey during lockdown and it deliberately did exactly the same survey as I had done some five years earlier uh, in order to get a, a real compare and contrast. Um, and it was looking specifically at knowledge workers. In other words, people like ourselves who use our brains for a living. No one tells us what to do. And we mapped out how people were spending their time, literally by going back into their diaries and looking at what activities they'd done, how they had chosen to do those activities, and how valuable they thought they were. And the bottom line is, A, people seem to be spending a bit more of their time doing what you might call valuable activities, a bit more time, for example, talking to external customers, uh, fewer hours spent in meetings. Um, and then probably more significantly, people felt that they were doing things because they'd chosen to do them rather than because their boss had told them to do them. And thirdly, they were finding this work to be more important, more important to their companies and more intrinsically kind of valuable or interesting to themselves. And what I interpret that to mean is that because we don't have a boss standing over us, we're sitting in our home offices, essentially making our own choices much more than before, we are more intrinsically motivated, we're making better choices. So that is what the results of the survey found for a specific group of people. So I think that's kind of good news. And there's lots of caveats, but the bottom line is, it's good news. That's really good news. And, and fascinating that you did the exact same survey and compare it to, was it 20, 2013 when you did it? 2013 was the actual date of the previous survey, yeah. Yeah, and that's what grabbed my attention. But then I also, at the same time, I just saw Ariana Huffington posted something and it had the opposite view. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, that basically productivity uh, has gone down by 5 to 10% and how people primarily because of all the stress and the anxiety and uncertainty are having a really hard time focusing. And that's why I'm going, okay, let's talk about this because I like contrarian views. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, and of course I haven't seen that study, so I don't know what her sample was, if you see what I mean. So I can say that, you know, anecdotally, I and many of my friends and colleagues are spending a lot of their time in meetings. So it is possible that my study looked at a relatively narrow group of people who aren't spending, who aren't, shall we say, in super senior leadership positions where they're spending all their time you know, in, in kind of coordination meetings. So it is possible that it's a narrow set of people. What, what else came out of the Ariana Huffington? Study? You know, she didn't, she didn't exactly um, provide a link to the study. She mentioned a source from a uh, professor in Stanford, but there are a lot of variables in there, to be honest with you. You know, it could be that, um, could be US versus yeah. the UK. Yeah, my, my survey was more Europeans than US. A few yeah, years. yeah, yeah. And I would agree with you. I think um, eliminating the meetings, at least a big portion of it, I mean, obviously these yeah. Zoom meetings, but a, a big portion of the meetings and eliminating all these non-essential tasks okay. um, and then being more in control. I mean, I had the exact same conversation with Andrew Barnes who's leading, I don't know if you, you've heard of uh, Andrew Barnes' effort to lead the four-day work week, but basically, right. basically it's uh, and he's where you are in London at the mm -hmm. moment, um, but basically he's saying, yeah, when people, when companies realized or, or were actually forced to let people go home, they also had to deal with the fear of well how are we managing their time all the time and your survey is showing the same thing that exactly. productivity w went up just like his survey showed that when he put his company on a four-day work week um nothing bad really happened that's right productivity I mean, the one, went up. The one, the one finding which i'm i'm most confident of is, is the last thing i said which is people are finding, believing themselves that their work is more important. In other words, because we're making choices, 
Mm-hmm. We feel, I mean, whether it's self-justification or whether it's genuinely reprioritization doesn't matter. The point is, we believe that our work is more valuable because we are choosing to do it. That is, that's a strong finding. And that's something I, I kind of feel, you know, as, as true as well as coming out in the results. And that's really important. That's the basic principle of intrinsic motivation. Right. Which is the heart of any sort of knowledge work. So right. That's, that's, and then as you say, that from, if you are now a manager of other people, um, as long as you've got people who are intrinsically motivated, it makes your job in some ways much easier because you do trust them. You, you are evaluating them on their outputs, not on their inputs. And you can then support them in their work rather than feeling the need to kind of monitor and cajole them in their work. So I think that's, I think that's really the way of the future as we move towards more virtual working. That has to become you know, the sort of standard role of the manager or leader. I would agree completely. So let's move a little bit about talking about resilience and, and this future of work. Um, I know you've um, done some work in that area. So where do you see companies finding more resilience and becoming more fit? So, I mean, I, we used to talk, you know, only a year ago about agility as the thing that every company needed to do. And agile was, of course, a particular methodology of work as well as a kind of a, a philosophy. But the trouble is that agility actually says, I'm just going to jump from opportunity to opportunity. It doesn't tell us anything about our capacity to withstand a shock. And of course, when you have a huge shock like COVID, like the financial crisis of 2008, what you need is resilience. You need the capacity to withstand that shock and to bounce back. And so when I talk to companies nowadays about how they are looking at the future, Resilience is front and center. And if, if you don't mind, I'll just break out three elements of resilience. Please. Yeah. I mean, the first element is basic operational resilience, which simply means that I can keep the show on the road. I can actually keep my you know, suppliers, you know, uh, selling, bringing goods through and my customers happy. Then you've got what we can call strategic resilience, which is the capacity to adapt to the changes that are going on around us. I mean, London Business School, you know, we used to sell programs to people who came to us face to face. We're now having to adapt to a world where they may not be joining us face to face. And that adaptation is strategic resilience. And there's lots of new techniques you need to do that. And then the third one, we can call it either human or behavioral resilience, which is making sure that our employees have the the capacity to withstand over months, if not years, a much more arduous set of circumstances where they don't have the social support around them. And so those are the three elements. And obviously the operational resilience piece was the first three or four months of lockdown. A lot of companies were refinancing and trying to figure out ways of just keeping things going. And now we're moving into a phase, I think, where both the strategic and the behavioral forms of resilience are the the kind of the strategic conversations going on in amongst leadership teams. And what are you seeing in terms of the human resilience part? What are companies uh, doing in that area? Yeah, I mean, they're doing a lot of very obvious stuff. I mean, there's, you know, most companies quickly figured out that they needed to have, you know, social gatherings on Zoom as well as just work meetings on Zoom. Uh, some of them tried to find ways of informally replicating some of the, you know, the water cooler conversations. They've now kind of bedded that in and they're trying to do, I would argue, a couple of other things now. You know, one is, and of course this varies by where you are in the world, but one is an acceptance that some sort of home working and office working have to kind of happen together. So you know, a lot of companies are saying you can come in one or two days a week and we're going to use that time to do all of the sort of the more social stuff that we was, wasn't happening before. And that, again, is fairly obvious, but of course, not every country can do it. The, the, the third piece, which I think is, is probably where, where we're seeing the biggest sort of challenge, is that personal development, professional development, doesn't just depend on taking courses. It actually depends on being given new opportunities to do different things. It often means working, learning by observing, actually almost like being just like a mini apprentice with somebody and trying to give people the, the training and development that allows them to progress through their organizations in this new hybrid world. That is probably the, the, the biggest 
problem to crack, right? Because we, we're quite good at, as we said earlier, efficiently doing what we've done before, but trying to actually develop and grow and, and mentor people and, and particularly bringing in new people into the organization, that's really, really hard to do online. So I, I say this is something which companies are thinking about, but I would say that's the biggest unmet challenge at the moment. What do you think the solution to that is? Yeah, I mean, yes. it's, it is, um, I mean, there are some things which genuinely just need a face-to-face -face setting. I, I mean, you know, no one's figured out brainstorming, you know, and, you know, big workshops where you're creatively creating something new through our divergent process. No one has cracked that online. And, and they don't, I don't think they ever will. We, we really do have to use those precious few hours or days face-to-face -face for doing those things. But I actually think some of this mentoring and development and apprenticing people with a little bit extra work can actually be done in an online setting. So, you know, the face-to-face -face conversation that we're having here, actually that works pretty well. I, you know, I've struck up new relationships with people. I've, I've got an executive coach who's helping me personally. I've never met her in the flesh and we actually have a pretty good conversation. So I, I think there are things which you need face-to-face -face for, and then there are things where we just got to work extra hard through these sort of online conversations. And we've just got to recognize where the gaps are and then home in on those, right? I mean, everybody recognized that communicating online was difficult. And a lot of companies, I think, put a huge efforts in, in May, June, and July to try to find creative ways of, of getting people together through town halls or whatever. I think we've got to use the same level of dedication and sort of extra effort for some of these personal professional development type activities. Yeah, it's challenging, isn't it? Because we, as humans, we're so worried for that social interaction. It seems yeah. to me like we're missing, we're starting to, to, yeah. to miss and, that social glue. And if I give you one other angle on the same point, which is we all understand that organizational culture is important in how we do things around here. And the trouble is that a lot of organizational culture is embedded in values and beliefs sort of hidden, but a lot of it's actually manifested in the day-to-day -day stuff that goes on, right? It's literally in the, in the physical offices we have, the way we hold our meetings, the sort of the ceremonies and events and informal get-togethers. And we, without knowing it, our culture kind of lives and grows through those face-to-face -face physical settings. And of course, all that is now on hold. So if you've got an organizational culture, you can just about sustain it through these sort of Zoom meetings. But, but I gradually, it's going to atrophy over time. And so, I don't, again, I don't think anyone's cracked this yet. This is going to be my next piece of research, is trying to figure out what kind of good practice looks like in terms of maintaining organizational culture in this new hybrid work environment. Well, I can't wait to see that research from you because it will be interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's it's, uh, it's going to happen um, fairly soon. Let's talk a little bit about... Um, your book fast forward and yeah, yeah. and your new book yeah. uh, as much as you'd like to disclose yeah. on that um sure. i for some reason i thought fast forward was, was a little more recent but uh, well, tell it's, me. Three, it's three years old and and the whole principle of that book was that you know and this is going to sound a bit outdated now but you know i was saying we're living in this fast changing world where you know we can't predict the future as much as possible and of course i had no idea what was what was really going to happen in that and that the principle of that book was all about we needed to, to become much more decisive that we shouldn't be agonizing over kind of analyzing data and getting to the perfect answer we should be decisive we should be tapping into kind of the emotional conviction of our colleagues a little bit more so a little bit getting out of the head and moving more into your intuition it, it, exactly and it was it was exactly that point it was you know we obsess over data and, and knowledge and analytics and that's all very well, but the trouble is you can get stuck in analysis paralysis. So we need to start moving towards a much more action-focused way of, way of, way of managing, uh, which, of course, the whole Agile movement built on, because, you know, Agile is all about experimentation and doing things differently. So that was that book. And, and I'll give you a flavor of the, the new book. If yes, please. You, want, you know, which is, which is it's again, I started work on before the... COVID hit, but it was all around, we're obsessed with 
the digital disruptors. We're absolutely obsessed with Amazon and Google and Facebook and, and these guys. And that's all well and good. But in fact, for every revolutionary change that's happening amongst those digital companies, there's a whole bunch of very traditional companies who are actually adapting quite nicely to this changing environment. And I'll, I'll give you just one statistic. You may not want to, to guess the answer, but if you look at the Fortune 500 list of today, the top 500 American companies, and you say to yourself, look, the digital revolution has been with us for 25 years. Roughly speaking, the internet, the commercial internet started in 1994, 95. So you say to yourself, okay, that's a long time, long enough for digital disruption to kind of work its way through the economy. So how many of today's Fortune 500 did not exist prior to 1995? And when I ask my students, they'll say, oh, maybe it was 100 or 200. The answer is 16. I was going to say it's pretty Much small, yeah. now, you know, Most people do not guess 16. I mean, even people who understand how the world works, they'll often say maybe it's 30 or 40, but right. it is literally only 16 companies, the ones that were famous, the Teslas, the Netflix, the Amazons, the Googles. And there are no more. The other 484 are all big established companies right. who, have a, who are adapting quite nicely to the changes. So, you know, we obsess about the, you know, the big trillion dollar Apples and Googles and Amazons. But in fact, there's an equally valuable story, which we just completely ignore, which is all these big dinosaurs, we call them dinosaurs, but actually they're not dinosaurs because they're adapting as we speak. They are learning how to cope with digital. They are, they are adapting quite nicely. And I think there's a, there's a story to be tell about all the different strategies they've, they've put in place to adapt to the digital revolution. I think that's an excellent point. That'll make for a really good book because we, are, we get obsessed, right? With uh, yeah. shiny syndrome and the tech companies are pretty good at getting their PR out and coming yeah. up with technology yeah. that we all use it. And I think that's probably part of it because it's in your hand just about that's right. That's right. Uh, and uh, every day. And, and of course, digital disruption is a thing, right? But then you take an industry like banking, which we keep talking about we're just about, we're on the cusp of the fintech revolution. Well, the last time I checked, all the banks down my high street were exactly the same as when I was a kid 40 years ago. I mean, mm -hmm. the retail banking sector is incredibly resilient and they managed to kind of accommodate every single wave of disruption and just tuck it under and carry on as before. So, of course, I'm not saying it's, it's, it, there are no fintechs, but you've just got to remember that there's a huge amount of inertia in that system, you know, for good or for ill. But to a point, um, some of these old companies still need to embrace technology Absolutely. in a, in a much different way than they are right now, if they are to survive. So, and, they, and they do have to, and I would argue that pretty much all of them are doing. In other words, they're not ignoring the digital revolution. They are using technology to get much more internally efficient. You know, they are using technology to, to speed up internal processes, to improve their quality of their relationships with their customers. It's not that they're neglecting the stuff. Right. But when we start talking about business model innovation and the idea that somehow they're going to get kind of killed off by disruption, is I think where, where it's a little bit misplaced. And I know that lots of your listeners will be saying, that's a lie, it's gonna happen, it's you know, just wait and see. But the trouble is I've been monitoring this stuff for 25 years and people always tell me it's just about to change. And I've now got to a point of actually saying, well, you know, I don't believe you anymore. And, I mean, there are some sectors, retail is badly hit, the tech sector is badly hit, the media sector is badly hit, finance is hit to some degree. But if I look at, you know, consumer products and en engineering and, you know, insurance even and auditing and law um, and aerospace, I mean, I could go on sector after sector are incredibly immune to fundamental disruption of, a, of an existential variety. They are not going to be killed off in the way that Nokia and, you know, and um, Blockbuster and Kodak were. Those are the three examples we keep coming back to. There aren't that many of those examples. I don't know how banking is in the UK, but um, for some reason, 
in the US, I am not happy with any of the banking websites yeah. and technology well, system, except for maybe American Express. So they really need to get, um, well, it's, get it's better at it. You know, they say in Britain that you're more likely to get divorced than to change your primary bank account. <laughs> and I don't know if that's true or not, but, but, the, the, but that gets the point, right? You know, we are so accustomed to whatever bank, whether it's any good or not, we don't like our current bank. We probably don't like the fintech. So what do we do? We just stick with our old habits. Right. Um, and that's just one of the, of course, one of the sources of inertia that helps the old guard to, to endure. And they also use, by the way, regulation to help. I mean, one of the, 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 the typical tricks when faced with a potential disruption is what you do is you, you try to make sure that the government blocks the new guys or you rewrite the legislation to protect you. All of which is fair game. Um, it may not be good for the consumer, but it's certainly fair game in terms of defending yourself. So in terms of, let's leave the big guys uh, aside for a second and let's focus a little bit on executives. And um, where do you see the opportunities and the challenges for them as we move into the future from a developmental and, um, yep. and leadership position? Yeah. So... And of course, in my role at London Business School, one of my jobs is actually running our executive education business. So I, I think about that a lot. And of course, you won't be surprised to know that I believe that you know, these executive education type activities in the round are fundamentally still very important. Um, and particularly so as we're moving to a world of you know, either greater digitization or more virtual working, clearly executives have to retool. You know, there's a, a well-known concept. It's called the 70-20-10 principle. You might have come across it. And basically, it may not be completely true, but there's at least a grain of truth in it, which is that, you know, executives learn mostly through challenging work assignments, through actually doing things differently on the job. That's the 70. 20% 20 through mentoring and feedback in personal relationships in work, and only 10% through formal training. And there's some truth to that, but the truth, the real truth is that, the real way we learn is back and forth between these different things. In other words, I learn by you know, doing something a bit differently and then reading about it or going to an executive training program and figuring out from you know, theory and from the, from the experience of the lecturer how to you know, interpret that and to do things differently. It's a sort of sense-making process. And that sort of circular process of development is basically what makes a difference between you know, a successful you know, development, developing executive and someone who kind of gets, gets stuck. And so executive programs of the sort that I run, either through getting a degree or short courses, you know, play a vital role in that. And it's, of course, it's a very frustrating situation because right at the moment, of course, not only can people not travel to, to these programs, they also are having their development budgets cut because most companies are, are struggling. And so a lot of that activity is a little bit on hold. And what we're trying to do at London Business School, and of course, all our competitors are doing the same, is we're trying to create some of these online programs, live online programs, where we're trying to, to at least recreate, to some degree, the same experience of, of development through, you know, through these sort of Zoom interactions. And it works. It's not, it's not as good. No one thinks it's as good. But you can, again, approximate the same quality of interaction as long as you do things in, in fairly small group settings. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, well, of course, and this is our lifeblood at LBS, you know. Um, you know, we get, we've got to find ways of, of bringing, you know, executive programs into the kind of the virtual world and and there's so much kind of free stuff online webinars or whatever um but really there is a there is an interactive activity which you know which i've been doing with my degree students and now i've got to start doing it with my executives and i think you just what you just said is the key is having some kind of interactive and accountability piece right. to the online program yeah, exactly. That keeps people engaged. I'm doing an online retreat with a, uh, a different organization later in the month. Mm. And, and uh, again, I'm thinking, okay, somebody's going to have to spend a weekend staring right. at the computer and call it a retreat. Right. That's going to be tough. Uh, so mm. trying to incorporate some interactive That's pieces awesome. and accountability and community so That's you awesome. can learn and, and learn from yeah. each other and exchange yeah. information. 
Yeah, and of course, Zoom, you know, is um, has breakouts, breakout rooms, right. and, and all the other software is now building that functionality. And it works pretty well because obviously, mm -hmm. you know, there's nowhere to hide if you're in a breakout of five <laughs> people. And so, so when I've been doing my, my teaching all last May, May, June, we use that breakout function a great deal. It was, it was yeah, amazing. that works really well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, I mean, it's again, it's just not perfect, but it's, it's, it's certainly better than just staring, staring at a screen to have a chance to talk to people. We'll, uh, we'll have to adapt, but the good news is we are adaptable. Yeah, we are. No, really. I mean, it, you've got to look at the bright side, right? Which is, we had no idea, first of all, if the technology would support this. And, you know, it did beautifully. And then fairly quickly, we all figured out these new ways of working, which, you know, for the most work part work pretty well. Um, mm -hmm. So it is, it is true that we've adapted hugely quickly in this huge social experiment of, of virtual work. <laughs> Um, but, but yeah, I can't wait. I, I'm actually going back into the office for the first time in six months on Friday this week. So oh, wow. I'm actually looking forward to it, you know. I'm actually, uh, I moved to working from home a few years back. I want to say yeah. probably six, seven years back. So I'm kind of used to the working from home part. But uh, it, at first, it was um, quite a bit of shock yeah. because you do miss that uh, social interaction. Yeah. So it just depends on, on your level of um, how you adapt with that and what you do to replace that, which is really that's tough right, right now that's with right. what we're going with. Well, that's right. Exactly. And as long as you can see people socially, you know, in your home life, then. Yeah. 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 Fine. yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much, Julian. It's been uh, really a pleasure to connect with you. I know it's really late where you are, so I'm going to. I'm going to let you go. Um, where can people get in touch with you, find out about yeah. you? I mean, look, I've got a website, julianberkinshaw.com. But you can also give them my email, really, jberkinshaw at london.edu. I'm sure you can post that to them afterwards. Yep. That's the only email I've ever used. So uh, people are free to randomly email me on that. Excellent. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your insights into this. And uh, good luck with your new book. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye.